Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is wonderful, wonderful to see you all on this excellent occasion. President Ono, Provost Macaulay, officers of the university, fellow deans, and dear friends, good afternoon and welcome to the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I'm Celeste Watkins Hayes, and I have the honor of being the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Ford School, as well as the founding director of the Center for Racial Justice here. I'm delighted to see this community from across the university, from the College of Literature, Science, Sciences and the Arts, the Rackham Graduate School, and so many others. We have representatives here from the Departments of Afro-American and African Studies and Political Science and History, as well as our friends at the Center for Social Solutions. We also have folks viewing online. We gather to salute our friend, colleague, and mentor to many, Professor Earl Lewis. As we know, he is the first University of Michigan faculty member to receive the National Humanities Medal. In the ceremony at the White House, President Biden said, Earl Lewis chronicles African American history and explores how diversity strengthens our nation. And it does strengthen our nation. As a university administrator who has shaped some of our preeminent institutions, pushing them to meet the challenges of our times, from water scarcity to the future of work to racial injustice, he makes American universities an even more important source of our national dynamism. Now, to start things off, I'm honored to introduce our president, Santa Ono, the 15th president of the University of Michigan. He joined U of M after serving as the president of the University of British Columbia, prior to which he was the president of the University of Cincinnati. As experienced vision, as an experienced visionary researcher, Santa has spent his career at research universities including Emory, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and the University of College London. Santa is also an accomplished cellist, and he holds degrees from the University of Chicago and McGill University. We thank him for his leadership. President Ono. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Watkins Hayes, for that introduction and for your outstanding leadership of the Ford School. It's always wonderful uh, to be here. I had a chance to speak with some of the students here, and they're just thrilled with your leadership and what they're learning here at the school. So thank you. Let's hear it for her. It's really wonderful to be with all of you today to pause, to celebrate uh, someone who means so much to everyone in this room, but to thousands of people uh, around uh, the world. Um, I've seen him. Uh, at different institutions, and uh, I know how much he's admired for his scholarship, but also for his support and mentorship of many, many people. Here at the University of Michigan, Earl Lewis is known by, uh, uh, in, in many different capacities, as, uh, as a professor, as a thesis supervisor, as a mentor, as a friend. Uh, as you know, he is a leading social historian, an award-winning author, and he's founder of a very important initiative here at the University of Michigan, the Center for Social Solutions. And uh, also, as you know, he's co-chairing a very, very important uh, initiative here at the University of Michigan, the Inclusive History Project. And uh, that's involving many, many members of uh, our community here, uh, faculty, staff, and students, and it's incredibly important work really taking an honest look at our history here at University of Michigan as a foundation to a better future and righting some wrongs that uh, have occurred uh, in post-secondary education, but also at our institution. Being truthful about our history is a very first step in the path forward. As you know, and you just heard from Celeste, he's the very first Wolverine to receive the National Humanities Medal. As you know, these national medals <laughs> these national medals are the highest honors given by the U.S. government. And uh, we've been fortunate to have a, a, a National Medal of Science, a National Humanities Medal, and we've also had uh, National Arts Medals as well. 
uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, for me, this is an especially meaningful moment because of the role, Earl, you've played in my own life. Um, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't uh, have developed into a leader were it not for Earl giving me the chance at Emory University. Um, I was uh, a very green administrator uh, when I was at University College London, and Earl took the chance in giving me an opportunity to, to work with him as his deputy and then senior vice provost of undergraduate academic affairs. And uh, um, every single day, I reach back to those experiences and to the lessons I learned from him uh, in what I do as president of the University of Michigan. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity, Earl, and uh, thank you for that and congratulate you on this uh, tremendous honor uh, to be honored by the United States government. And with that, I understand that we're going to listen to a wonderful conversation between Dean Watkin Hayes and Dr. Lewis. Thank you very much. Congratulations again, Earl. Thank you so much, President Ono, for those uh, wonderful remarks. Hello. Hi there. So great to be with you and so great to see you. I'm going to start with the obvious reason why we're all here, but we're going to unpack all of the other reasons okay. why we're here, all of the different ways that you've had impact. I wonder if you can tell us about the call. So the call, it actually started with an email. Uh, before the call, and as some in this room know, um, <laughs> on a Monday evening late, it was after 9 o'clock, I get an email from someone connected to the White House uh, asking me if I'd be willing uh, to take a call the next day from the chairwoman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I, I said to Susan, I, I hope this is not another assignment. Uh, to be honest, I mean, uh, there had been a handful of requests for me uh, to take on an assignment or two uh, for President Biden, and for a variety of reasons, I hadn't been able to do so up until that point. But I said, sure, um, I will be glad to talk to her. This is, this is the window. Uh, and uh, as you know, Celeste knows, because we were, as fate would have it, Celeste was the next person I saw after that call because we were having lunch that day. Uh, and, uh, and this is before they told me I wasn't supposed to tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get a call and I realize it, instead of an assignment, uh, it's an honor. And I was floored and, and taken aback and, um, and every now and then left speechless. And so that was one of those moments. Tell me about the significance of this award. Why do you think it's important at the presidential level to recognize scholars, to recognize people who've contributed to the humanities, people who contributed to the sciences? Why, why do these awards matter? The awards symbolize in many ways that the work you do is not just about yourself. It actually accumulates and is important for the overall civic project called the United States of America. And when you end up with an award from the President of the United States, it signals to you and to others that what you do behind closed doors or in meetings or elsewhere actually is important. And this is all the more important for the humanities. In a certain way, the arts, because they have a performing side and a visual side, seem to be more in the present and people get to see it. The humanities, when you're writing and you're telling stories and you're producing poetry or analytical examinations of text, sometimes seem hidden and you have seen politicians of all ilks, uh, Republicans and Democrats, this is bipartisan, uh, who have questioned the value of humanities uh, in very public ways over the last decade or two. And so to be able to stand up and to be recognized and to be in the company of the people I was in the company of uh, is a way to say that not only do, did the work that I in, in undertook mattered, but the work of all of us matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually important. Mm -hmm. um, and as someone who ran the Mellon Foundation for five years, where at one point Mellon was actually giving more money for work in the humanities than either NEA or NEH uh, combined at one point. It's now uh, may have been surpassed, but during my presidency, we were 
doling out uh, about $300 million a year um, for the humanities and the arts, uh, far more than the national government. So it's important symbolically as well as materially that in some ways uh, we recognize this work. So you and I share a love of stories, yeah. and particularly origin stories. I wonder if you can take us back to your origins, <laughs> to Norfolk, Virginia, yeah. and help us connect that little boy to this individual who receives the National Medal of Humanities. On my block, my brother is here, and so I, I should, my, my, Rudy, and on our block, and growing up in the segregated South in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, there was no clear path to a national medal. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, and even imagining that you would get invited to the White House uh, was something that was beyond the dream that we could have. But, and so I, I look at this, but I'm also reminded of my grandmother. And, and so this is the, the origin story. So uh, in the last couple of years of my grandmother's life, this is the early 1980s, I was doing research in Norfolk on what became my dissertation in my first book. Uh, and so I decided, who better to interview than my grandmother, uh, who had lived and grown up in the Norfolk area her entire life, and she was in her 80s at that point. And so my grandmother told me something she had never told me before. And it was about her own dreams and about a dream deferred, but a dream never to be denied. So she had, was born uh, turn of the century uh, in rural Norfolk County, moved into the city of Norfolk, and had always wanted to go to college. And in fact, she wanted to go not to, co to college generically. She wanted to go to St. Augustine College in Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm. She actually had a particular college in mind, the HBCU in Raleigh, North Carolina. She saved twice. And each time, her father came and asked her to surrender the money to save an older brother from losing his house. Mm. And so she would say to me that it was like nothing actually impacted her greater than that than death to sell because she realized what she was forfeiting for family. So fast forward, this is the 1920s. Fast forward to the 1940s and after World War II, um, my grandparents had three kids. My mom, Virginia, was the oldest of the three. My grandmother had not been able to go to college and had worked as a domestic most of her work in life. My grandfather was a laborer working uh, for the U.S. government uh, at the Naval Air Station painting planes. And so my mother, it was decided was going to go to college at that point to uh, Norfolk State, which was the Norfolk Division of Virginia State College for Negroes. For anyone who knows the Virginia educational landscape, Virginia State was in Petersburg. Norfolk was the upstart. Uh, and so uh, and my mother started at Norfolk State. My grandmother decided that was not a good thing. So the good God-fearing, church-going woman that she was, she played the numbers. <laughs> and she hit. And she used that to actually send my mom to college. Mm. And in some ways, that's the origin story. Yeah. Because my grandmother believing that college was important made sure that all three of her kids went to college. So by the time I came along, that was the expectation in this working class black family in Virginia, that education was a ticket mm -hmm. and a path. And the ability to make a way out of no way. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So how did you decide that higher education would be the path for you? <laughs> it sounds uh, like your, your family had a love of education, but was there pressure to do something else? Yeah, I mean, it was, <laughs> pressure was to get a job. Yeah. Uh, and, and so for those, this is 1970s, uh, and so I graduated from uh, Concordia College in 1978, and Bill Kraft, the former president of Concordia, is, is here with us. Uh, and that was in Moorhead, Minnesota. And Harold Pope, who was my classmate and who lives in Detroit uh, and a prominent lawyer, I mean, there was a group of black kids all trying to figure out how in the hell we ended up in Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and 50 years later, we're still trying to figure that out. I don't know if Har Harold may have a better explanation than I do. I decided it was metaphysical. Something from a previous life uh, led me there, and, and, and I made my way through it all. Um, and so when I finished undergrad, I decided I was going to go to graduate school, and I applied to the University of Minnesota. It was the only place I applied uh, to go to graduate school in, in history. And, but I was going to get a master and make my master's and then make my way back to the East Coast. And when I was there my first year, my good friend Joe Trotter, who is a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, he looked at me and he says, Earl, you're going to be the next one of us. I said, the next one of us to do what? Uh, he said, you're going to be the next one of us to finish it and get your PhD here. Mm -hmm. Joe saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself at that point in time. And he was prophetic. He was right. Uh, Joe, as he would tell the story, Joe finished his PhD at the University of Minnesota in the late 70s and 80s, early, faster than anyone. He did it in five years. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and uh, I mean, these are the years where there was no support. I mean, extraordinary. I did it in six. And so at that point, I thought, okay, I think I can figure out this professor thing uh, and, um, and maybe I should be good at it. But it was in part because I had mentors. I had mentors who were classmates. I had mentors who were faculty members. Um, Russ Menard, who is my primary advisor, was a colonial historian, an economic colonial historian. And, and Russ would look at me and he says, Earl, history stopped after 1800. And he said, the rest of this stuff is present tense. Uh, and, and, and he and I would laugh. And I said, no, Russ, history starts again in the 19th century into the 20th century. Um, but we would laugh about it, but he showed me things about what it meant to be a professor mm -hmm. and how, and he and John Modell and Clark Chambers and Monsignor Kaba and Alan Isaacman and a whole range of others became touchstones for me about the possibility of living life as an academic. So talk to us about how you craft your intellectual trajectory. When you think about your articles and books and the ways in which you have really been successful at weaving together history and policy discussions and black studies and all of these different disciplines with this connective tissue around black experiences and black life yeah. and the promise of America. Can you talk about how, how did that come together? How did that become your part of your life's work? <clears throat> I'm actually trying to write an introductory chapter to a book of essays, my own essays, and that's going to be published by the University of California Press. And so I've been forced to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, and my brother's going to laugh at this. I give credit to uh, the most unlikely person in the world, our geometry teacher uh, in high school, mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Overby. Mm -hmm. This is 1971 uh, in, in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. Mrs. Overby uh, was iconoclastic, I, I would say that, but she also was one who um, hewed closely to an old vision of the world. So in one day in my geometry class, Mrs. Overby decided to regale us with the stories about the good old days on the plantation. And you know, sit with that for a second. You're a young black kid and this is your geometry teacher deciding to give you a history lesson. And um, it took a few minutes, and one of the older, I was a sophomore, one of the older students in the class finally looked at her and said, Ms. Obey, can we get back to the lesson plan? And she, it snapped, and she returned to geometry and vectors and angles and a whole range of other things. But I realized later on that that moment was a story about race and power in American life. Because what do you think she was trying to achieve in that moment? To, to remind us of power in place. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so there was no ambiguity. Uh, I mean, as we said, and my, my brother and I laugh about it later because Mrs. Overby, uh, my brother went on to get a graduate, undergrad and graduate degrees in, in engineering, electrical engineering, but Mrs. Overby was trying to convince him there was only one way to solve a proof. Uh, and, 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 and she ins <laughs> insisted that her way was the only way. 
I mean, and so it was not only in her conversation about race that day, it was also her pedagogical approach that there was only one way uh, to do it, and hers was the, the way. But that day, it was something else. It was the case that while the school had desegregated, and she was now forced to teach black and white and other students, that was not her preference. That was her job, but it was not her preference. Mm -hmm. On this day, she wanted to actually insert her preference into a conversation that interrupted her job. Uh, and that piece about history and power and the ways in which race inserts itself into mundane activities like teaching geometry um, sits with me all the time. And, and, and uh, it's, it's funny, I <clears throat> ask students uh, from Berkeley uh, to Michigan uh, to Emory uh, to around the country, I go, um, so how many of you have ever played the racial guessing game? And they go, what's the racial guessing game? I go, how many of you have actually walked into a room or walked across a street and you see someone ambiguous? And before you know it, you're trying to place them somewhere. What's that about? For all those people who tell you race doesn't matter, how come you play the racing, racial guessing game? What's the socialization and the process that leads you to do that even when you know you shouldn't be doing it? In some ways, that brings me back, because it was clear to Mrs. Overby that you didn't have to play the game. The game was there, uh, and we were part of it. And I have sat with that uh, from that geometry class in 1971-72 to the day, 50-some years later. And it is something we still, as we all know, grapple with yeah. as a country and as a world. And um, one of the things that we talk about within the Ford School are that policies have genealogies mm -hmm. and that understanding that historical context is so critical for understanding where we are now. Yeah. So when you look around and see where we are right now at this present moment, as a historian, what goes through your mind? It's an interesting question. As a historian, my first uh, response is, yeah, we have seen bits and pieces of this before hmm. uh, and uh, have to understand how and why. And so as Celeste knows and some of you uh, know, we, the Center for Social Solution in partnership with WQED mm -hmm. just released uh, a documentary on PBS nationwide called The Cost of Inheritance. And it's an examination of history, race, and reparations in the United States. And so there, um, I mean, there's an example in there of John Boyd, who's an African-American farmer in Mecklenburg County in Virginia. And John tells a story in this documentary about not 1953 or 1963 or 1973, but 1983, trying to get a loan uh, from a local federal representative uh, for the Farm Administration. Uh, and he was said, in, as late as 1983, this agent would only see black farmers two days a week for a limited set of hours. And he tells his story in the film where he was sitting there, he says, one day, where um, he had his time and the agent allowed a white farmer, who was named Earl, uh, to come into the, the room during his time and handed the white farmer a check for $173,000. He had been fighting for several years to get a check for $5,000. That disparity between his right as a farmer and his desires as a farmer has a whole lot of antecedents. 1983, 1993, 2003, it's the Obama administration before actually the government begins to right the wrong of years of denying black farmers the same access to capital as they awarded white farmers. And that story is there in the history. I mean, for those who decry the claim that 40 acres and a mule makes no sense, um, as some members of Congress have said recently, all the people responsible for that are dead. 
And I said, that's absolutely right. They are dead. But we are the descendants of those uh, who actually made those laws and policies. Forty acres and a mew were impossible, but yet we still provide 160 acres at a time uh, under the Homestead Act, which was the latest, the greatest wealth transfer in American history. Do you think that if people had a deeper understanding of history, they would think about policies and policy prescriptions differently? Do you think that's part of the reason there's a concerted effort to not teach history and to not engage these yeah, I, I, issues? I, I wish it was more. as straightforward mm -hmm. as if people knew history, they would be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think part of the challenge is, is that we're dealing with power in so many different ways. And who gets to claim it, who gets to hold on to it, who gets to assert it. And so history can be used and misused, as we've seen. And demagogues oftentimes actually know just enough history uh, to get people to follow them. And it's not that they are ignorant of history. It's how they use and misuse and abuse history uh, for their own whims. And we look, you know, I, mean, I, I sit here. I mean, we can watch an event on national television on January the 6th. And then people will tell you later it didn't happen. Or it didn't happen the way that you saw it with your own eyes. And you're encouraged to believe in some ways that counter narrative is indeed the correct narrative. Uh, and it raises profoundly important questions about for school and others where it's not history, it's a certain kind of literacy that we need uh, to make sure that we're about. How do we make legible the past? How do we make sure that people are literate enough to understand and question what they see and go and look and try to understand what are indeed the original sources? I mean, so I'm less sanguine that history writ history is this saving device, more so that a certain kind of literacy is critical at this moment when so much is coming at us in so many different forms that you can't tell fake from deep fake. How do we think about that as educators? It's something that at the university I know we're very concerned about. Colleagues across the country are concerned about it as well. How do we translate that? How do we reshape our curriculum? How do we reshape how we're instructing students to have that deeper le level of of legibility and understanding and literacy. Yeah. I mean, I think there are three ways that I would say uh, that we can address it. One is to actually be uh, quite upfront uh, about our own limitations. I mean, there are certain things we can know and certain things that we may not know. And so that piece, I think, is critical. I mean, um, you stand in front of a classroom, you oftentimes want to be the authority. You're taught and you've been taught to be the authority. But how do you surrender that authority uh, as an instructor and uh, deal with the vulnerability of not always having all of the answers or the most complete set of answers? So that's one piece, and so there's a pedagogical part to it. The second part, I think, has to do then with how we actually um, accumulate the sources that we're going to use uh, to explain whatever it is about the past or the present uh, that we're trying to connect. And how do we really pull those sources? And then the third part is actually how we invite our students to be the active learners. Because what I've learned over almost 40 years is that if I'm standing in front of a classroom lecturing, my students get so much. If they have to actually turn and be the instructors and actually go and understand how that material was made what the argument is, what the sources are, et cetera, and then teach it to the others in their class, then they actually learn more. And I've been able to test this over years, and I realize that redesign of the classroom where the students are not the passive recipients, but the active creators of the knowledge that's being produced in the classroom also means that it usually sticks with them longer than if they're on the, you know, on the other side of the table just receiving. Do you think higher ed is struggling from a PR problem where we're not good at telling our own story in terms of what we do, or do you think we're in the midst of a power struggle? A little bit of both. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 
I, I, I was laughing with someone last week. I go, you know, if her head was as good at corrupting young minds as being alleged by some, <laughs> maybe we think we that good? There'd be no news story. Hmm. I mean, because we were succeeded. And, and, and all, and we go, and so, so I laugh at a certain level uh, at, in the perfect way, the innocence of the claim and that somehow um, that there are these unformed individuals who walk into a classroom uh, and we sort of mold them into uh, these little proselytes who go on and go out and proselytize uh, in a certain kind of way. I'm like, eh, it doesn't happen. Um, at least it's not been my experience, at the very least. Uh, and, and so that's one part. The second part of it is, yeah, we do have a PR problem because, uh, it, as some of us who know, um, <laughs> you, you can't get all the Big Ten schools to agree on the same thing. Uh, and you certainly can't get all the AAU schools, uh, which are the major research universities, to agree on the same thing. And then you multiply that to the 4,000 colleges and post-secondary institutions in the United States and imagine that we speak with one voice. And we don't. We've never spoken with one voice. I don't know that we should. I mean, so some part of the heterogeneity of the institution of higher education in the United States is its power and perhaps its weakness, uh, that we aren't all the same thing. Uh, we never have been, never will be. But that means then for those who want to pick out a story and pick out a theme, uh, we are easy prey because uh, we all aren't the same and we don't speak with the same and we don't have the same intentions. Um, but So how do we navigate that? How do we respond to it? How do we um, think about um, an effective voice, set of voices as opposed to one voice as yeah. it relates to the importance of higher education? I mean, I think part of it is you try to figure out who's in your neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so as a higher ed institution, when I was a chairperson of the Concordia Board, I would say to Bill oftentimes, what neighborhood do you want to be in? And who's in your neighborhood? And how do you influence the folks in your neighborhood? And how do you engage in conversations with folks in your neighborhood? We all live in communities and trying to get people to understand uh, something about their community. My, my good friend, George Sanchez, t told a story that I often repeat uh, all the time uh, in many different settings. And, and George, if I get it wrong, you can correct me uh, later. But uh, George was telling us, uh, uh, we were in a meeting, and George was offering an example in Southern California. And I think, if I remember it correctly, uh, there was a, a vote uh, coming up in this community about uh, paying more taxes in all for public schools. Uh, and one person stood up saying, you know, this really isn't about me. My kids have all grown up, and, and why should I pay more for somebody else's kids? And as I remember the story, another person stood up and says to that person talking, may I ask you three questions? And the person said, sure. When you're done, do you plan on retiring? And the person said, yeah. Says, well, when you retire, do you plan to sell your home? And he says, yeah. Well, when you sell your home, who do you think is going to buy it other than those other people's children? So an investment in those other people's children is an investment in your retirement plan. And for some people, that's the motivator. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and all of a sudden, for that person, as I understand it, a little light bulb went off in his head, that he was no longer disconnected, that he was actually part of a community. He was in a neighborhood, and place in that neighborhood mattered. That's the same thing for Harry Ed. And part of it is talking about our connection yeah. to so many different people, so many different stakeholders, so many different constituencies beyond just the students in our classroom, right, and all of the impact we have. Yeah. We live in a big, wide world. Uh, I, I, I was, um, had the great fortune of being invited to give the, uh, the 75th Distinguished um, Lecture for the Fulbright Program or something like that. I forget which number. Was it 75th? It's 75th. Look, I distinguished uh, for the Fulbright Program between the UK and the US. And so I was in Edinburgh right after Thanksgiving. 
uh, and realized that a conversation there, I was giving a talk entitled The Grace of Reparations, uh, and arguing that as we look across the world, the whole question of race and reparations is not an American story alone. The UK and Europe and the rest of the world has its own versions of that story. And how do we pursue a graceful way of beginning to think through what are our obligations to one another? And I think part of the challenge and the opportunity for us as we sort of ponder the question, uh, Celeste, is to think, okay, this world is more connected now than it ever has been. I can send a message and in 15 seconds to someplace sitting in, in a phone someplace in the rest of the world. And you sort of realize what that means. I mean, there are moments when I yearn for the analog day when I would get a letter and I would sit and let it sit there for a few days and then I would respond and then a week or so later it would get to where it was going to be uh, and, uh, and communication was slow and um, easier. Not easy, but easier. And now you realize that almost everyone in this room if you get a text or an email, it's expected to answer within 35 seconds to 45 seconds. And you think of what that does to the brain loop. If you're always on and you're always thinking about how you're going to answer and how quickly you need to answer, well, you don't get a chance to pause and think. When, when I was provost at Emory and, and Santa may remember this, uh, we, uh, the president provost, uh, as provost and the president and I and the rest of the cabinet, we had a rule uh, on big, complicated issues, we were going to suspend time. We were going to say that we weren't going to answer in the next 24 or 48 hours. We would tell people we would get them an answer in, within 48 hours, but we wouldn't rush to try to get an answer in that first 24 to 48 hours because in some ways we had to figure out how to slow time. Mm. Me, and in this connected world, as we think through these problems, how do we begin to address problems that are more than one or two or three millennia old? I mean, I, I, I've been given this commencement address, and poor Susan has heard it uh, more than once, my wife, uh, where I remind people that geneticists have now confirmed what we long knew, that all humans share 99.9% .9 of the same DNA which in effect means that all of human history has been written about one-tenth of one percent of difference. And you think of the fact that over the course of millennia, we've forgotten our shared origin story, going back to your first question. We have a shared origin story. We've moved away from that shared origin story, event by event, decade by decade, century by century, war by war, millennia by millennia. What does it mean to sit on that notion that we all share the same 99.9% .9 of the same DNA, that in effect all of human history is about that one-tenth of one percent of difference? Is that part that actually forces us to reconnect with one another, but also to ask different questions about how we tell that, that shared origin story? So much of the Center for Social Solutions really brings that concept to life of the commonality that we share. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me how you selected these four key areas of focus. And you're doing this at a point in your career where you've looked at and thought about so many different topics, so many different ideas. You've had an administrative career where that's taken you from U of M to Emory, um, work at the Mellon Foundation, seeing hundreds of proposals for ideas. Yeah. How did you settle on the four driving ideas for the Center for Social Solutions? And you're right, they were my ideas. I always tell everyone else, no one else should be held responsible for the four ideas that I came up with. So the first one I'd already started. Uh, and so before I joined the Mellon Foundation, um, I organized a convening at the Mellon Foundation. So I was the president designate. Uh, and we brought in a group of people. Nancy Cantor was in the room. And we brought in university presidents, general counsels, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, we were trying to think through post Gruder and Grotz after Hopwood and, and, and others begin to think through um, what the terrain and landscape looked like mm -hmm. and what people knew. And so out of that came OCI, the Our Compelling Interest series, mm -hmm. uh, because we realized after that convening of 25, 30 you know, very uh, smart and able and well-situated people that they knew less about the law, let alone the science and the scholarship behind the Gruden and Gratz cases than we um, had hoped. Uh, and so we thought we needed to come up with a new effort. So we ended up calling in our compelling interest the value of diversity for a prosperous democracy. So that was already there, and I had already started it before I decided to leave Mellon. So thrust one so was, that was thr diversity and, and, and democracy. democracy. Okay. But then I'm a historian uh, and an American social historian, and it was circa 2016 or so, and I'm sitting there going, 2019 is right around the corner. And, um, and I'm a native Virginian. And so uh, we're approaching the 400th anniversary of the importation of the first African peoples into uh, colonial James, uh, Jamestown in Virginia. Um, slavery is almost like that specter that's always off stage but never completely gone in American life. And in my view, we had not fully addressed or dealt with it. And so I, I could see that we were getting close to 2019 and we were going to need to do something about it. And, and, and I remember um, when I raised this issue and this prospect with um, some folks at the foundation, including uh, my, my board chair and others, they were a little leery uh, of taking on uh, this uh, topic. And, and their body language encouraged me all the more hmm. <laughs> that I had found the right topic and entitled because I deeply believe that the story of slavery is not an old story, it's an ever-present story. And according to more recent data, there are more people in some form of unbounded labor in the world today than at the end of the 19th century of forced labor. And so when you began to look at more recent contemporary statistics, you realize that the story of Human trafficking is just one example of the continuation of the story. So for us, then, slavery and its aftermath um, became the theme because I wanted to center it in certainly the, the, what we think of as the second slavery, um, that period of the transatlantic slave route. But that transatlantic slave route had a sub-Saharan slave route, an Indian route as well. And so most Americans, we talk about one, and not the other. And those two together talk about much of the world. And so we went there. But then I was struck. I was, when I was at um, Emory, we were in a meeting at the Carter Center. Um, well, actually, we're at George, Georgia Tech with representatives from the Carter Center from Georgia Tech and, and Emory. And, and there was, um, at Georgia Tech, I believe it was, a colleague was telling the story. And then, uh, Jeff Copeland, who had been at one point in his life the director of the CDC, uh, would tell another story. But the story went something like this, uh, where um, there was a West African village without drinkable water close by, and the women would have to ferry water from a uh, somewhat contaminated river stream uh, into uh, the central village. And so see the little World Bank, I think it was the World Bank and not the Inter International Monetary Fund, but one of them funded a project. And they brought in the engineers. And the engineers did what engineers do. They examined the problem, and they came up with a solution. They built a well right in the center of the village. All done, or at least they thought. And then to their surprise, the women kept walking to the river to get the water. And they couldn't figure out why the women were still walking to the river. And so eventually they brought in a, an anthropologist and a gender expert to talk to the women. And the women said, yeah, like we like the clean water, but that wasn't the only reason that we actually went to the river. And there were other social 
ways where we actually got away from the children and the men and the household duties and the community by going to the river. Putting the well right there solved one problem and created another one. Because mm -hmm. then you're right there. And they're right there, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. And, and that for me became a metaphor, mm -hmm. I mean, in a, in a lot of ways that we oftentimes try to diagnose a problem believing that we have actually spoken to all the right people without speaking to the actually most the, the, the central folks mm -hmm. uh, in the overall narrative. And so as we're thinking about that, so I ask the question, I go, so what does it mean then if to be able to move water? I mean, what would it mean to be able to move water from flood-prone areas to drought-stricken areas? Uh, and, and in uh, between Fargo, North Dakota, and Moorhead, Minnesota, and the Red River Valley used to flow north and flood every year. So from slavery and its aftermath, theme two, to water and security. Yeah, water and security. Yeah, water and security yeah. became a way because all of a sudden mm -hmm. engineers would say the same thing. It's not an engineering problem to move water from one place to another. It's every other kind of problem. We have pipes that can, and, and hoses that can move vast amounts of water from one place to another. Um, and the question becomes, then what is it, what does it mean to be every other kind of problem? Uh, and in a world right now where climate uh, is, quote unquote, an existential threat, I mean, I think it's a threat. I don't think you have to even modify it. Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> it, you, you reference I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk has been stinking since I've been born uh, and, and continues uh, to, to be underwater. And that's a problem because that's where it's the naval, East Coast Naval Fleet is housed. And so uh, they're just trying to figure it out. But what does it mean then as we think about water? And so I thought this is the wild card question for me as, as a social historian. I'm, uh, but the, I have wonderful colleagues in the Center for Social Solutions uh, for whom uh, the study of water and then colleagues in engineering and others uh, that uh, we're learning along the way as we try to move this along. And then fourth, real quickly, is the dignity of labor in an automated world. Mm. Uh, and this stems in part, I started as a labor historian, among other things, and so I've always been interested in workers uh, and the dignity of labor. Uh, and um, it's alleged that uh, between robotics and AI and all, what it means uh, to labor is going to change uh, and is changing. Uh, so how will we ascribe dignity uh, to work? And, and I think of this in, in, in a Western context, but I think in a modern context. Almost any place you go in the world, at least in a Western setting, within five minutes of encountering someone, the conversation usually turns to, so what do you do? What do you do? And imagine a world in which it's impossible to answer. What do you do? And so we started with that question of trying to sort of situate, thinking about what do you do? And hence the dignity of labor in an automated world. I want to ask you about the Inclusive Histories Project, because that, too, is a place of exploring our common humanity, yeah. dealing with some difficult truths, um, encouraging us to think deeper. And I wonder if you can, first of all, for people who aren't familiar with it, talk about the Inclusive Histories Project, and then talk about the significance of what it's meant to be involved in this project here at the University of Michigan. So the Inclusive History Project uh, has um, three starts mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in a way I tell the story. Mm -hmm. Now others here may tell the story differently. And so uh, it started in part over Fielding Yost uh, and Pakewa, the President's Advisor Committee on University History, uh, recommending that Yost's name come off the ice arena. Uh, and there's a reason behind that, and I was on that committee. So I, I say this as someone who was on that committee because of Yost's involvement in the incident that led to the bench of the Willis Ward uh, in the 1930s when he and Jerry, Jerry Ford were on the football team, uh, and, et cetera. That decision, our recommendation was heard, and the question was, is that enough? I mean, and should we not? 
and in fact do more and do a broader and deeper examination of the university and its history. Uh, and so that went from Mark to Mary Sue to, to Santa uh, and, and, and that sort of order and that cadence. And so um, we spent the first year in what I refer to as year zero, which upsets some of my colleagues. And, they, uh, uh, and, and, and I'll take the blame because I was the one who wanted to call it year zero uh, because I didn't want to give anyone the impression that we were doing anything more than framing and designing how we should go about studying the institution's uh, history. And that's not to say that people weren't already doing work. We, we've said it multiple times, and I'll say it again. We knew that people were already doing work, and we were building on that work. Um, but we didn't want to imply that we were starting to do work until we actually understood what we were trying to achieve. And so we spent a year designing and framing. And now this year, uh, we actually have begun the work of trying to understand the university's own history. Two centuries worth of history uh, there. But doing it a little differently than most others. And so many other colleges and universities started with a story about slavery. And slavery uh, was a defining moment uh, in their creation. The University of Michigan doesn't have the slavery narrative as a defining moment. Um, and so we are going back uh, to 1817 and the land grant uh, with uh, Native peoples in the state of Michigan, uh, what became the state of Michigan, uh, and what that responsibility is uh, and has been. But we're also trying to do something else, which I think is actually key. We frame this as a uh, project that's also to be reparative uh, in nature. It's not just about telling the story about our past, but it's just to actually tell the story about what needs to be repaired in the present. And that is hard work uh, as we make our way through, and as I've said to Santa on more than one occasion, this is, a, at a minimum, a five-year project. It could very well be a decades-long project. Uh, and I will, if it's on the other end of a decade, I will watch. Uh, <laughs> I will have gone off payroll by that time. Uh, I'm, as I remind people all the time, I'm on a five, I was on a 10-year lease, I'm now on a five-year lease. Uh, and, and so, and the clock is ticking down in, in, in that direction. And, and so, that means then that we're trying to get a certain number of things done uh, in the next uh, period. And so we have several major uh, efforts uh, underway. Our, our website will be released in the next few couple of weeks. And so that will be the first public attempt uh, to really share with the broader community uh, what we're doing. Uh, and But we will have reports. And uh, for those who are interested, you can actually read the, uh, the Framing and Design Committee report from last year. But our hope is to do three things uh, at a broad level. One is to be reparative. Uh, and so we'll be able to see that. Uh, and so that means that if we're telling the same stories about the university uh, in 2030 or 2035 that we told in 2020, we will have failed. I mean, we really fundamentally believe that. It should have forced us to take a harder look. And so if the young people who are giving the college tours give the same college tours uh, in, in five or 10 years from now, we deem that a failure. Uh, and we've said that uh, as, as an example. Um, but we also um, believe that this should be where people get to take it and do their own kinds of projects. Uh, and so we're trying to support faculty, staff, and students who want to initiate projects, as well as their sort of guide big projects that the institution itself will be about. And then the last thing I would say in, in this, at, at a sort of high level is that um, we also expect that in the end, the iconography of the campus will change uh, in some formal sense. I mean, and um, the markers, the signage, signage all of that uh, should have changed a little bit. Whose pictures on the wall? Which pictures are on the wall? How long they stay on the wall? Perhaps even what names are on the wall uh, will change uh, as well. And those are our expectations. It's nice to be on the front end of all of this rather than the back end uh, because you can still remain quite hopeful. Yeah. I want to finish where we started, which is when you talked about the metal 
and receiving the National Humanities Medal, and, and for those who are which is in beautifully right displayed <laughs> here. Um, you talked about its significance in terms of people. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting to me, all of the different institutions that you've been a part of, um, and you've named in reference many of them here, you come back to the University of Michigan. And I remember when I was thinking about moving and I had lunch with you and Al Young. Yeah. And I said, tell me about the University of Michigan. So I'm gonna close by asking you, what is this place called the University of Michigan and what has it meant to you and your career? Hmm. So the University of Michigan is both a physical location and an imaginary location, I mean, at some level. I mean, I, when I was away, so I, for those who don't know, I was here f for 15 years the first time, uh, 89 to 2004. And then I went away for 14 years, 2004 to 2018. And then I came back in 2018. And so as an imaginary place, imagine yourself walking along somewhere on the upper west side in Manhattan, and you have on a Michigan camp. Exactly, and go blue. <laughs> and, and, and you don't even need to know the person. Uh, if you just walk by, and the only exchange is go blue, and you keep walking. Uh, and, 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 and it's that part of an imaginary community that you're part of. Now, half the people, I'm not even sure, were Michigan alums, but they had the cap, mm -hmm. and they were still part of this imaginary community. And it's that part piece that even when I was away, I could still sort of touch that imaginary community. But it was also a place where um, I dare say I and my colleagues and the graduate students and others that we um, work with changed our respective fields for a generation. And so I mean, I've been looking at George, uh, and, and George will remember this. And we will walk George Sanchez, who's now at USC, but George and I were walking across campus one day. I said, George, I got a crazy idea. And he says, what is it? I said, we should start a new book series. Uh, and he says, really? I said, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's do it, and we'll pull in some others. Well, that crazy idea became the American Crossroads book series. Uh, and 50 books or something close. 70 books now uh, uh, published. At least half of them are award-winning books, and at least two of the authors have gone on to win MacArthur's. One of whom was Talia Miles, who was our colleague uh, here, but she published her first book in our series. And the other one was Natalia Molina, uh, who's at USC now, but who was a graduate student in the history department uh, here. And so we created in this space opportunities for a new generation. And that for me is actually the greatest part. When I came here, um, I was a whole lot younger. Uh, and, and I remember sitting at lunch on my first um, being recruited. And all of my colleagues treating me to lunch that day were telling stories about service in World War II. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Edie will know who some of them were. And, and, and I'm sitting there going, OK, um, I think I'll figure out a way to be part of this department. I, I certainly was not around in World War II, let alone fighting in World War II. And, and all. But it was that space where we came in, and we, we, uh, I was given the license to recruit uh, with others, Robin Kelly and Elsa Barkley Brown and we build the strongest program in African-American history in the country at that period in time. George came and, 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 and we built it out uh, even more, and there was a group of us who were here who were determined that we were gonna actually shape and reshape uh, aspects of American history. That part I actually think about, um, and then of course, what I didn't know, uh, and, and when I first moved here in, in 89 from Berkeley, that I would become an administrator. I mean, in fact, 
I, 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 the joke is, and, and Jim Grossman will know this, I left Berkeley because they, um, in part, they want to make me an administrator. I mean, mm. when I got an offer from Michigan, uh, Berkeley's response is that we can make you an, we'll give you tenure, we can make you an assistant dean and give you more money. And I go, oh no, I, I, I'm done. And then within a year of arriving here, I was the interim director of the Center for Afro American African Studies. They do that here. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you come in with a plan. And they do that. They do it. But I discovered something <laughs> along the way. I, I discovered something about administrative life that I didn't know uh, when I was leaving Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And you probably have discovered this as well. Um, I discovered that, one, I was actually good at it, more so than I even dared admit to myself in the first couple of years. But two, it was, for me, psychologically, it was the right blend because as an administrator, I could make a decision in the morning that had consequences by the evening. Uh, so much of academic life was about deferred gratification. And that at least in history, I write an article, it go through the review process, et cetera, et cetera. And by the time it came out 12 to 18 months later, I go, I don't even remember this. I mean, let alone, I've been reading sometimes, are those my pros? I mean, I didn't even remember. And, and, and it was this part where something about being able to say, and this was what Michigan also meant, it took a chance on a young person to lead, and then eventually when I became Dean of Rackham uh, and all, it gave me more than one opportunity uh, to lead. Uh, and, and that is something that I did value, do value, and will value forever. Earl Lewis, we celebrate you, we appreciate you, we love you. We can't wait to see what's next because we know that there is much more work ahead of you. We're so excited. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. my very distinct honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dean Ann Cruzan. What a remarkable conversation and it, what a difficult position to be in to follow that conversation. <laughs> um, but we're thrilled to celebrate you and this medal. Um, I was, I'm Ann Curzon, I'm the Dean of the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and I was in the Dean's office when we got word that Earl Lewis might be interested in returning to the University of Michigan. And institutions are not known for moving quickly or for consensus. And I have never seen so much consensus or speed <laughs> in the LSA Dean's office <laughs> that I saw at that moment. Um, and we're thrilled to get to co-host the celebration of you with Celeste and with Ford, um, because as you all know, Earl is jointly appointed between our two schools. And um, this conversation, I mean, what a remarkable scholar you are, um, who both shows the power of the humanities in your own work and have been doing that for decades, but we also see you harnessing the power of the humanities, and it's what you're doing at the Center for Social Solutions and was doing, you were doing at Mellon, and of the social sciences by bringing colleagues together to address the most pressing problems. You are also, as we've seen today, a brilliant advocate for the humanities. You are also one of the most generous university citizens I have ever met. Um, as you're getting a sense of, I mean, Earl is running the Center for Social Solutions. He is also teaching. So he is here today, his students are watching or are here because he should be teaching class right now, but we are very glad that he is here. And also, every time I turn around and there's an important committee, who is on it? Earl Lewis is on it because you say yes, and it's such a gift to all of us. And as I was sitting here and you were talking about this medal and why it matters in terms of the importance of the humanities for this civic project that we are in, and um, of course, in LSA, we house a lot of the humanities units, and I was thinking about all the ways in which we try to talk about the power of the humanities, and I've learned so much from you about how to talk about it 
in terms of, first of all, it's a place where we go to find meaning, as well as solace. And I thought about that a lot during the pandemic, when here we were alone often, and we turned to art and music and history and literature and philosophy. I remember meeting someone who said, I started reading the Stoics again <laughs> during the pandemic, um, and history and plays and film as a way to make meaning and find meaning. Um, as you were just talking about, the humanities tells history and retells history um, so that we, in that retelling, can try to confront our own biases and confront what it means, um, these misconceptions, and consider what we learn as we go forward from that. Um, it imagines alternate worlds. And I love what you said there in terms of what does it mean to move water, right? Not what engineering is involved, but what does it mean <laughs> to move water? Um, the humanities interrogate how humans respond to each other, how our communities, and as you were talking about, these com complex connections, and how we respond to change so that we can be prepared and be persuasive. And I was thinking about your remarkable rhetor rhetorical toolbox and that one of the things we're also trying to do is expand people's rhetorical toolboxes and make them, as you were talking about, more discerning listeners and readers because, of course, history can also be used to manipulate. Um, if the humanities ask us to consider key ethical questions, we push on notions of truth and fact as we strive to pursue both. And then one of the ways that I have come to talk about this, and I was thinking about it as we were sitting here, is that we, um, and it goes, it's a quote from a fellow dean of mine, actually in the Big Ten, who said, empathy is not just a value, it's a skill. And it's a skill that we have to hone, and it's why we study history and read literature and study art and languages, is that we are honing empathy, and this is a world <laughs> that needs more empathy. Um, and you are someone who brings such deep empathy <laughs> to the work that you do. So um, I have said to you before, and I want to say it here, it is one of the privileges of my career to get to work alongside you here at the University of Michigan. Um, as we've seen today, you are forever pushing us to embrace new perspectives in our work. Um, you bring those perspectives into dialogue and to be unafraid of true structural change. <laughs> because true structural change is really scary. Yeah. And you showed us here as you were telling these wonderful stories that you demonstrated again and again what it means to be unafraid, what it means to be unafraid to take on the hard questions, to be unafraid of change, both in research and in administration, and you've shown us, you've shown us both. So I know personally that you are wise in your counsel and you are generous with your time and energies. You are optimistic and pragmatic. <laughs> And that is an amazing combination. Um, so thank you for all that you do. We are thrilled that you were honored with this medal. You are both an inspiration and a model for so many of us. So if you can all join me once again in celebrating Earl with a round of applause. And now we hope you will join us. There's a reception right outside. So we hope you all will stay and join us to celebrate with Earl. <laughs>